inheritance inheritance patterns in a population this is that last little bit of this module um it definitely by the time you get here you can definitely feel like it's been a long um tiresome module so have some patience here it's not a big um dot point it's just you know looking now at the big picture of you know how does how can population genetic patterns be predicted with any accuracy why is that important we'll talk about like um preservation uh, and conservation um strategies and we'll talk about why that's important as well okay so dna sequencing let's start off with that how firstly how are we going to predict them how are we predicting um dna patterns now we looked at why did we look earlier at pedigrees and planet squares so that we are able to now you know look at um and predict the different um predict the different variations of like phenotypic expression and stuff now we look at how we can actually dna sequencing how i can go ahead then and look specifically at the dna where the dna is coding for that specific allele you know remember in the chromosomes at some point there's going to be a little allele that codes for my hair color my eye color or something so i may specifically want to look at that and you know extract that or something so we're looking firstly at dna sequencing um so firstly isolating dna from the cells so if you really hear dna sequencing we need to isolate dna from the cells remember dna is going to be in all of your cells so we are isolating that secondly identification of sequential order of nucleotides we are going to need the specific nucleotides that specific part that is going to perhaps code for a certain trait or code for a certain um and, and this is helpful you know even when we look at for, for you know crime shares and stuff you would have seen the investigator comes in and they're taking part of you know your hair or something um that's found on the crime scene they're going in putting into the lab finding the dna and being using that in order to identify the person kind of we kind of thinking along that track here now so we identify um identification of sequ uh, sequential order of nucleotides there is computer um computational processing here so now we are comparing comparison of whole genomes i've got someone's whole dna i'm comparing it you know i'm comparing the stain found let's say on a knife to the hair that's found on the you know the strand of hair that's found on this crime scene and comparing whether those dna's match or not right think i always i think when you think about it in terms of you know mainstream media and the depiction of it kind of makes it a bit easier it may not be used for that specifically there's lots of other users that we'll talk about later too um but that's like the really famous one that you would have come across okay so we've got computational processing occurs we are comparing the whole genomes then from there transcription and translation of genes in Sciatia. so that's a specific program here then single nucleotide information now i'm finding the specific that specific information over here um each individual has different genome remember that's what makes us unique having different dna um identification of differences and similarities so whatever the you know the handprints that are found on the um the crime scene versus the hair strand that i found now i'm looking at whether those are matching what are the differences and similarities the whole thing may not match right due to chance like the whole thing well more than likely the whole thing will match if the person is the same but sometimes it can be two different people but parts of the dna match we do see that that's something that's popped up um you know as as a proper thing in in the specific field of air where there's that where there is a unreliability in this process but for now just think about that identification of differences and similarities um modern computation allows that pattern to be identified and then and then we trace inheritance of genes alleles and snps between people now from there dna sequence you i've got a dna i'm able to sort of see the differences between the dna now i look at dna profiling i collect dna samples from cells common practice blood hair follicles mouth swabs um digest the dna so we cut the dna into small pieces and we use that restriction enzyme to sort of just see you know what part of the dna are we looking at what illegal are we looking at we look at hair color or um eye color or something or so remember we're just looking at you know we can look at the whole thing but we more than like we're using a restriction enzyme to look um in specific places then we've got dna fragments are se uh, separated by gel electrophoresis so it's a machine basically you put the dna in it and then it's using electricity to kind of um the dna is moving so in over here 
it's a bit hard to explain um without you know having the actual machine there um or if you haven't done it have a look at youtube videos of gel electrophoresis that will definitely help where they've got actual machine and they show you know what's happening but to explain it to you i've got the dna over here let's see i've got samples a and c so a is what i found on the crime scene c is one of the suspects i'm going to put the dna over here and here then once i start the machine off the dna is going to move according to you know the electricity it's moving forward when it stops if there are the same places, if oh, actually I've got a marker here, A is where I'm putting the um, where I'm putting the crime scene over here. A, B, and C are my samples. So let's say C is the suspect. I've got the marker here. The thing is moving, 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 and then once it stops, you can see the similarities over here. So C matches over there. C matches over here as well. Um, that's B, and then C is matching in three specific spots to the marker. A is only matching in one. And B is only matching in two places. So is that giving me concrete evidence that it's C? No, because not the whole thing is matching. But it is telling me that C, I need to investigate C a bit more maybe. Because that matches more than A and B. But this is where, again, that unreliability and uncertainty arises. Because sometimes, you know, it can happen and may not even be that person. But anyways, focusing here on the process... Um, collect DNA samples from the cell, digest DNA, cut the DNA into small pieces using a restriction enzyme. So I'm just putting in the small piece over here. DNA fragments are separated by gel electrophoresis. The gel visualizers show a band patterns. These are the band patterns and that's what the, um, that's what it's showing over here. And fingerprints can be compared. So it's specifically looking at print, uh, fingerprints. Visualization of fingerprints allows for comparison of patterns. The degree of similarity equals the degree of relatedness. So basically, what I'm what we're saying over here is that A, you know, is not as related to the marker in comparison to C. So there's that degree of relatedness. It's not, remember, it's not, uh, it's correlation, but it's not like, um, so, what, so there is a correlation between them, but I can't say that it's not causation. So what, what, I, what I basically mean by that is, that I'm saying that there's that similarity, but it does not give me like direct proof that C is a culprit. Not saying that just yet. Um, there'll be more investigations done for that, but from a science perspective here, we're thinking that the, that the degree of similarity in those band patterns is going to be the degree of um, relatedness. So we may observe conserved regions of the DNA and effective in, um, and effective in humans due to large stretches of junk DNA. We'll be look, talking a bit more about junk DNA in, um, in module six as well, but we do see that there's that um, it's effective in humans because of the uniqueness of a DNA. Okay, now let's have a look at where does this all the whole thing come into play. So we can use this in large scale collaborative projects. So from there, we can gain trends, patterns and relationships in order to then apply those findings um, and put in place distinct projects or distinct um yeah, distinct projects or distinct, um, you know, regulations or something, especially, uh, especially when we are looking at um, conservation, animal plant conservation. That's why it comes into a huge, um, into a huge place. So conservation management. So conservation genetics, fields combining molecular genetics, ecology and biodiversity sciences in order to propose species management strategies. Um, uses population genetics to identify alleles at risk. So if I'm looking at, um, and this is used, you know, when we look again, Slido chucked me out, but there were no questions so far. If there are any questions, please pop them up. But anyway, back to conservation management. So, um, you know, if we look at animals that are, um, that are going to be extinct, you know, a big example of that is, for instance, uh, Tasmanian devils, right? So if you're looking at that, we're looking at what specific alleles are putting them at risk and how can we counter that? And we find that. Um, you know, by for instance, by looking at devils that have already passed away, you know, looking at their DNA, what was there um, versus an animal that's sick, seeing if there's, let's say, any similarities between that, um, between the DNA patterns over there. So it uses population genetics to identify alleles at risk. It proposes ways to manage and preserve biodiversity. So Australasian um, Wildlife Genomics Group at the University of Sydney, um, they have a project going on. So the Devil Tools and Tech Project, they've got the Koala Genome Project and Marsupial Genomics. So 
They are working closely with um, the Australian Museum, Chicago Zo uh, Zoological Society and National Cancer Institutions, for instance, in order to find ways, in order to find um, use population genetics to identify what alleles are at risk and then counter that um, by proposing ways of managing biodiversity. Um, so yeah, that's that. Now, inheritance of disease. So only a 0.8 nucleotide variants among humans. So all genetic disease must be contained within this variant. That's the variants that we have among humans. So any genetic disease that we've got, they are contained within that variant. So understand the cause of genetic diseases. For instance, it's a heredity. Um, sorry is it hereditary um due to random mutation or by what interaction of the alleles um we are then able to design therapies to repair the genetic disorders so human genome project so collated data on the doubt on thousands of genomes to identify genes variable uh, variable regions haplotypes etc um the human genome project was quite big um in the 1990s in the 90s and early 2000s because it was a big scale collaboration um within scientists around the world where they looked at mapping the human genome so it was huge it was new technology a big deal um the u.s government inv invested a lot in it and so did other institutions as well so collated data on thousands of genomes to identify genes variable regions and haplotypes um they have identified genetic ca causes of breast cancer alzheimer's um, and colon cancer as well so this basically, you know, when we look at um, being able to have the genome of thousands of peoples, hundreds and thousands of peoples, will then allow them, allow them to basically go ahead and look at, you know, what are the similarities and differences in the interaction of alleles within these um, distinct um, genomes. If we look at hereditary diseases, um, or we look at yeah, and when we look at hereditary diseases, like for instance, breast cancer, where are we finding the interaction of the alleles that tells us, okay, they are at risk of breast cancer, this is what the risk is, and then how can we counter that? So it really does tie in with the bigger sort of scientific question of, you know, improving healthcare um, and having better resources for people. So then we've got human evolution. So Within that, we are looking at cultural and regional groups and often linked by prevalence of particular haplotypes. Mapping haplotypes allows us to trace the movements and evolution of human species um, and identification of common ancestors too. So we will talk about mitochondrial Eve and you know how we've been able to trace back to mitochondrial Eve who lived... Um, Sorry, give me one second. I've got my charger playing up. Uh, okay. All right. What I might just do is just got an issue here happening over here with my charger. Give me one second. I'm gonna have to plug in my charger. Um. All right. So what I'm gonna do is just give me one second while I do that. Um, but I'm just going to quickly finish off with this and then we're going to pop over to Slider to answer a couple of questions. What battery do I have? I've got 19%. It's going to be enough for this. It's running out a bit faster than I imagined. I just charged it this morning. So computer problems again. All right. But anyway, so we've got human evolution. Um, and like I said, we have been able to trace back to mitochondrial Eve who lived um, in Africa 20,000 years ago. And we've got the in, uh, International HapMap Project. So it uses genome data to identify SNPs, haplotypes and haplogroups. And from this information, we are able to, um, we're able to track lineages between populations. All right.